Jesus Christ. We want to thank God for the gift of life as well as the opportunity for us to be together this evening as we continue with this Uplift Conference. Let me also take the time to greet those who are following us from the various pages that are currently streaming online. I pray that God blesses you as you continue to participate um, with us in these sessions. More than family, more than relationships, more than marriage. I want to echo the words that have already been mentioned by her ladyship as she would be addressed in the courts of my country is that uh, the topic is quite broad and uh, it would not be so easy to cover all of it in the few minutes uh, that we are allocated, as you would have seen, is that she also uh, did not have enough time to finish uh, the presentation. I can already confirm in advance it will be the same with me, uh, but we will try nevertheless. Uh, traveling also it does uh, give you a point of interest. I was mentioning um, when her ladyship was here the other day and she presented, and when we were going back to where we were staying, I, I had to pause and ask everyone, is that is this uh, the protocol in Ghana, is that when a judge addresses you, you do not stand up? And they say, no. I said, in my country, it is blasphemy. When a judge stands up to address an audience, whether it is in a court or in a church, it is our protocol that we stand when she takes the podium and we stand when she sits down. And I said, okay, so people must not say South Africa is a liberal country. Ghana is liberal. Um, we are very conservative. We take our judges very seriously. During the next few minutes, I will make three submissions to you and the submissions that I will make will focus on three aspects of home and family life. And I will try to present them in such a way that I encapsulate everything about home and family life, touching on issues of marriage, of course, but also family in general and the relationships as well. I will make my first submission to you, which will lay the foundation for how we relate to each other. And then I will make my further submission in terms of how we deal with our perspective of marriage. And then I will make my final submission based on an example of a marriage that I will pick from the Bible and I will use that marriage as my case study. That will be the conclusion of the presentation that I will make today. So the first part I want to submit before you is requiring that we read a few verses in the book of Genesis. They will be the foundation of my first submission and then we will move on uh, to the rest. The first submission is going to be based on Genesis chapter 1, and I'm going to be using verse 27, 28, or 26, 27, and 28, and then also I am going to cover briefly from Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 to 20, as well as one section of Genesis chapter 3, and then I will make the submission. Allow me to read first Genesis 1. 26, 27, and 28, and I am reading in my Bible, which is the Africa Study Bible, and it reads as follows. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals and on the earth and the small animals that move along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over it, it, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, 
and all the animals that move along the ground. I want to first make my submission on the basis of this text that it is the thorough theological and biblical misunderstanding of this text that has led to the conflicts that exist in the family and in the marriage and in the relationship particularly between men and women. I make no unreserved statement when I say between men and women because although we live in a world in which we now accept with the laws of various countries is that there are individuals who identify as many different things. Today there are people who will say, I am neither a he nor a she, I am a we, I am, we are a they. With the due respect, while I definitely respect the autonomy of individuals to speak for themselves, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ rooted in the Bible, permit me not to venture into phrases which the word of God has not authorized me to. For the purposes of this discussion, there will only be males and females. There will be no days or it or any other form of identification. With that, I do respect... I do respect that your constitutions, wherever you may be watching from, may allow other identifications, but again, seeing as I am not called to be the minister of the constitution, but of the Bible, I will limit myself to this. This verse is the challenge. One of the most fundamentally broken things in our society is the relationship between men and women. This relationship is broken because from the misunderstanding of verse 27 came a misunderstanding of Genesis chapter 2 verse 18 and 19 and 20. And I'm going to read them in order to provide context so that as I address Genesis 1, you have them at the back of your mind. From verse 18, the Bible says in Genesis 2, then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals but still there was no helper just right for him. These texts present us with a theological challenge in our relationships. Because when we read the Bible, the man Adam was created in Genesis chapter 1. The female was created in Genesis chapter 2. And because of this space in creation, Christian theology was infiltrated by the idea that the female is inferior to the male because the female had been created after the male. Are we together? In most of our Christian approaches, the female and her humanity is not given the biblical dignity it deserves. And out of this understanding is born how we approach marriages and family life. But listen very carefully. In verse 27 of chapter 1, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. Verse 27 is that foundational necessary verse. Because what verse 27 teaches us is that before men were made, before Adam was made, 
Verse 27 is clear. The male and the female are the image of God. The male and the female appear in God's original plan even before he executes it. Unfortunately, ignorance about this text has created the patriarchal cultures in which because a woman was created second, it is seen as the basis upon which she is treated as lesser in the relationships. This is a betrayal of Genesis 1 verse 27. Genesis 1 verse 27 is clear. There is no superior gender in creation. Both of them were made in the image of God. Both of them were in God's original plan even before he made the first among them. Therefore, a woman is not an afterthought to God. And to understand this will change the way men approach marriage and the way women approach marriage. What do I mean? As long as men believe they were God's original plan and the woman was an afterthought, it will always then influence the terms under which a woman enters a marriage. You see, if a man is convinced that he is God's desired original creature, and that the woman is an afterthought. The terms of entering a marriage already then define the woman as a servant and the man as the true image of God. But this is not a man problem only. Women who embrace their inferiority also assist in their absence in God's vision for life. There are many women who unfortunately not only embrace but promote the inferiority of women in life. And this too is against the will of God. Genesis 1 verse 27 is clear. The woman and the man were part of God's original plan. The question we should be asking, why did God create Adam first and Eve later? The answer to that question has nothing to do with the value of humanity. It has something to do with the demonstration of the purpose of marriage. With regret, I will not have enough time to venture into that one. If we had to answer it, you will be here till 10 p.m. But the point is clear. It is in the way God says it. It is not good for a man to be alone. What is God saying? Since human beings are created in the image of God, one of the things that human beings must know is that God is a communal God, yet who is one? God is a community of self. What do we mean? Let us. Let us. In the beginning was the word. And the spirit of God hovered above the waters. God is in a community of self. God is one. God is one. But lives in a community with himself. In his community... He is revealed and exists in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is one, but exists in community with himself. When God creates human beings, he creates man, woman, but that is not all. The last verse says, and the two shall be one. So there are three people. In other words, a marriage is a reflection of the community of God. So the creation of Eve after is a demonstration 
of the holiness of communion, not the less value of the woman. Women are not inferior. The sooner you clear this, the sooner we will solve abuse in Africa and in the world, the sooner we will change our mindset about the types of positions women deserve to be in or not to be in. Humanity must learn women were in God's original plan with the men side by side. They were not an afterthought. Once you solve this mentality or not solve it, it will determine whom you will marry. You see, a man who believes he's superior is searching for a perfect servant. A man who believes he is equal to women is searching for a partner in life. These two are not searching for the same. We cannot build marriage on a faulty software. Our understanding of creation is faulty. And from a faulty software, we have developed faulty applications of what a marriage should be. Yes, I agree. Within the marriage, the roles are not the same. This is true. But again, we must be careful between inferiority roles and different roles. These are not the same. A woman can give birth, I cannot. These are differences, not inferiority and superiority. However, to say that I am a man, I do not cook. The question I ask is, what is in cooking that you lack? Is it the two hands? Is it the eyes? Is it the ability to switch on or off the stove? You need to demonstrate why women must be the only one who cook. Because I can demonstrate why women are the only ones who can give birth. They have features I don't have. So clearly there's a difference in the species. But when it comes to home duties, you need to explain to me why is it that a man must be a breadwinner? What does a man do to be a breadwinner? He uses a brain. Is it something women do not have? We have faulty applications. By the way, in Genesis 2, God says, I shall create a suitable helper. I could write a thesis on that one. Because in the word suitable, please pay attention. Nowhere in the word suitable did God describe who cooks, who cleans, who works. These are human cultural inventions. All God said, you need a suitable partner. In other words, suitability must be discussed by the couple. As long as what you do achieves the goals, then it means you have achieved the standards of suitability. I can page the Bible with you. There is not a single verse where God said, therefore shall women cook and clean, and therefore shall men go out and work. Not even one. We must be careful because of a faulty software. We have developed these faulty applications of what a marriage should be. Clear the software. Men and women are equal. If you do not understand the software, the application will not work, whether you are a man or you are a woman. Once your, app, your software says, I am an inferior woman to my husband, you will tolerate things that God will not tolerate, but you will think you are holy as you are doing it. Some of you are tolerating nonsense, but you believe you are holy because you are wired for inferiority. You are not holy, you are abused. 
There's a difference between those two. Holiness does not accompany inferiority. In fact, where there is holiness, the creature is expected to rise to the highest possible level of excellence. Wives who are holy are not available to be abused. How can you be holy and be abusable? The two contradict each other. The software must be proper. No one is less. Genesis 27 is clear. Male and female, he created them. The image of God is found in the male and the female. The second aspect I wish to bring up to us is a theological crisis of positioning the work of Jesus Christ properly in the marriage. What do I mean by that? In the book of Genesis chapter 3, sin comes into the world. And when sin arrives, we find this statement in Genesis chapter 3 from verse 16. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth and you will desire to control your husband but he will rule over you. Please listen very carefully. How did a man gain dominion over the woman? Because of sin. Before sin, there is no verse that gives us dominion over women. But we can't end there. We need to then put the cross of Calvary into perspective. The cross of Calvary is not merely about restoration spiritually. But in the death and the life and the resurrection of Jesus, we are also invited to living new lives in him here on earth. What does that mean? If sin gave us gender dominion, the cross restores us to a time before sin arrived. Which means, when I look at my wife, I no longer see her through the authority that the curse gives me. I see her through the restoration that the cross gives us. So, no man who loves his wife will enjoy authority given by a curse. That doesn't make sense. Why would you rejoice on authority established through a curse? Should we not be seeking something perfect? How can the kingdom of God be built on a curse? That doesn't make sense. For me to be happily married, I must move from the curse to where God reverses the curse. And God reverses the curse at Calvary. And at Calvary, what happens? I am challenged to live as a new creature. As Paul would say, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That means when I look at my wife, it is no longer the conditions set by sin that guide us. It is the conditions that are set by the cross. Now, I know someone out there is answering, but pastor, the book of Ephesians chapter 5 tells us is that we must have our wives submit. I like that. The only thing I've discovered about that story is that in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talks about submission first for everyone. And that is the part that the Christian church has missed. Before Paul applied the submission on women, he first demanded that we must all submit to each other. Read from verse 15. 
Paul first says, you submit to one another. For some reason, every man has forgotten to read that verse. We only catch up when Paul says, women submit to your husbands. But that is what we call isogesis, reading a text that favors you. In the whole chapter, Paul first makes an argument, we must all submit to one another. So by the time he brings an application on the marriage, he has already made a case that first, Submission is for all believers to each other without any gender limitation. Having made these two cases, I can now make the case for the marriage that I want to use as the study case. But to understand what I will say, you must first be clear on this. The biblical position of the equality of the genders, the biblical instruction that we must be suitable, whose application depends on a proper understanding of human equality in creation, and thirdly, the choice between whether you want your marriage to be conducted through the curse or through Calvary. Of course, if the curse gives you the authority you desire, you have no reason to go to Calvary. But for those of us who believe that Christ is the foundation of everything we believe in, then we understand that it is no longer in line with the will of God for any man or woman to look at each other through the curse. We must now wear the spectacles of Calvary. When I look at my wife, the only thing that must be in my mind is is my treatment of her consistent with the kingdom of God? It's that simple. If Jesus came to our house today, would I do to my wife in the presence of Jesus the things I'm doing to her now? Let that be the question every husband and wife asks themselves. If you want to know whether you're doing the right thing, it's the simple answer to it. Ask yourself the question, if Jesus came to live at our house for a year, would I do to my wife or husband the things I am doing to them? All right? I know my answers. Would I have sex with my wife with Jesus in the house? Of course, he created sex. And he told me that marriage is holy. So I would not be shy to have sex. In fact, in his presence, we might even do it more. The question I would ask myself is, with Jesus in the house, would you beat up your wife? If you can say yes, I don't know if hell is even the right place for you. I don't know. We would have to discover another version of what to do. So the point that I'm making is this. Our consciences in our marriages are not guided by a curse. They are guided by the teachings of the kingdom of God. When we look at our wives and our husbands, we must abandon sin as the software, but wear the kingdom of God as the software on which we build our homes. In the book of Genesis chapter 20, comes my case study. There is a couple there called Abraham and Sarah. I do not have enough time, so I will rush very quickly. Ed, Elder Daniel is a very punctual man in standing at the back and showing you your 10 minutes are over. <laughs> so let me rush while he's still sitting down. In the book of Genesis chapter 20, there's a story told there. I do not have time to read it. Abraham and Sarah have arrived in Canaan land, but before I deal with it, there are two similar stories. The first one is in Genesis chapter 12, but it happened in Egypt. I will not use the Egypt one because they are, where they are similar, they are 100% similar. 
I will use the one on Genesis 20 because it has some differences. But it's two events, two different times, but we are going to learn something from them. Abraham and Sarah arrive in Canaan land. The Bible says Sarah was a very beautiful woman. And the Bible says, Abraham says to Sarah, you are a very beautiful woman and I will be killed because of you. So please, I beg you, when we get to a new place, tell them I am your brother and that you are my sister so that my life may be saved. Then the Bible says, when they arrived in Canaan land, the king of the land, Abimelech, saw how beautiful Sarah was and asked, who are you to each other? They answered, this is my brother, this is my sister. The king says, well done, I am now going to pay your dowry and I am taking this woman as my wife. King Abimelech marries uh, Sarah. While he was sleeping that evening, God comes and says, I will kill you and I will kill your entire household. For you have taken the wife of a prophet, a servant, to me. Abimelech says, my lord, I did no such a thing. The woman I married today was traveling with her brother. And God says, that man is her husband. Abimelech wakes up and calls everyone, his entire court, and Abraham and Sarah. He says, Abraham, Sarah, why would you do this to me? You have dealt with me worse than an enemy. Why did you not tell me the truth? Abraham replies, I told her that this is the kindness you will show to me. Whenever we are in a new place to save my life, say I am your brother and that you are my sister. And I was afraid that there is no God here and we might die. And indeed, she is the daughter of my father though not the daughter of my mother. Then the Bible says, Abimelech gave them gifts and they left. Borrow me your ears for a few minutes as we deal with this case study. Number one, Sarah was extremely beautiful. Sarah was so beautiful, the family needed to manage her beauty. By this time, Sarah is around 78 years old. I shall not ask how our 78 year olds look. I think we can all agree the problem is on all sides. Whether male or female, no one looks good now, it's, it's, it's bad. But Sarah is 78, a stunner of a woman, very gorgeous lady, somewhere close to my wife, but not really. My wife is a bit ahead of Sarah and will prove it when we get to heaven. <laughs> so, he then, the Bible says, she was so beautiful that they had an agreement. When we get to a new place, we need to have a strategy for your beauty. Lesson number one, I want all of us to understand. All families are beautiful. The problem is the strategy you are using to manage it. You see, seated here, many of us are not investing in the beauty of our families. We are busy envying what other families are, not realizing those families have gone through fire and flood, volcanoes and war to create the beauty you envy. All families were put together by God with the capacity to be beautiful. The ugliness in your family is as a result of you failing to manage each other, not as a result that God never made you beautiful. So, stop envying other families. Work on building your own. All families have a Sarah element. But listen to me. You've got to know how to manage your Sarah element, the beauty of your family. All families are beautiful. I am saying it again. The problem is 
you wake up to destroy the beauty of your family. Others wake up to build it. Then you go around saying there are problems in your family. My brothers and sisters, of course, you beat up your wife. We don't beat up ours. Why do you think our wives are always smiling? They are happy. It's not miracles. We work to do it every day. You know, some preachers, for example, I've seen preachers standing on pulpits, condemning uh, makeup, condemning women who are putting on weaves. But the same elder has an extramarital affair with a girl that he gives money to buy the same things. Of course, if you don't invest in your wife's beauty, you will look like mother and son. <laughs> of course, if you don't invest in your husband looking good, you will look like a grandfather and granddaughter. What you see in other people's marriages is what they are investing to produce. You want a beautiful wife? Very simple. Be easy on the pocket. Be easy. You want a beautiful wife? It's very simple. She gave birth to children to grow your family name. So when she gained weight, you are part of the problem. So what do you do? Go to the shops, buy your Nike or Adidas sneakers, Come and say, my wife, you and I, we are going to jog together. <laughs> Produce what you want. Produce it. It's very simple. Sit on the table with your wife. Eat the salad. Let the children be, be busy eating the chicken. When they ask what is going on, tell them, stay out of it. This is between me and my lover. We are building the bodies we want. My brothers and sisters, it's very simple. I love for my wife to have beautiful nails. She's my wife, not the wife of the church. When my wife... When my wife touches me, I don't want to be touched by a construction worker. I want hands that are soft. You know when your wife moves her nails on your neck, you feel it. I am touched by a wife, not a fellow elder. Invest in what you want to see. Invest, manage the beauty of your family. People can't be destroying their families and then running around complaining. What you want to see, invest in it. My husband and I, my wife and I are always fighting. We don't know each other. Then you ask, when you are at home, how much time do you spend talking to each other? I love my wife. My wife's company doesn't bore me. And because God blessed us also not to be employed, but to actually run our own institutions, we spend a lot of time together. I'm here, I miss my wife. Whenever I'm holding my phone, I'm talking to my wife. I say things I want to laugh at, but no one will understand, because my wife is not here. If she was here, we both would have looked at the same thing and started laughing. Because we, we, we are bonded, we spend time with each other. I don't understand people who are frustrated with their wives. You chose your wife. Now you want us to stay with you out there till midnight. We didn't choose your wife. Some of us are not escaping our wives. We miss our wives. You made a choice. Go sit with each other and talk until you rebuild the connection. 
can't be calling us at 9 p.m. Where are you? Let's go to the, uh, uh, to the sports bar. I don't want sports. I want to be with my wife. There are benefits of being there. <laughs> Marriages will not produce what we don't invest. It's that simple. We take holidays with our wives. What happens with you? Every time the company wants someone to do overtime, you volunteer. <laughs> then you wonder why there is no connection in your house. Some of us, it doesn't matter. Listen to me. I work for God. I work for the church. I love my work. But you know what? There are times when I'm called and people say, Pastor, are you available? I say, no, I'm not available. What do I mean? My calendar is empty. I'm not preaching anywhere. I'm with my wife and children. Not preaching anywhere. I take time out a whole month not accepting any invites. Why? I want to be with my family. I love the woman I chose. I love the children we have. I'm not frustrated by being with her. Invest in what you chose and stop going around telling us, hey, 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 you know women, as soon as you walk through the house, you want to stop your wife from complaining, be present. So that she can empty the complaints. Stay until she reaches a zero. When she's at zero, there's nothing more to say. But the more you are not present, the more the list of things keeps growing. Some of us have pursued money and have done so well, but we were doing it for empty houses. Some of us, we've become millionaires, but as soon as we arrived, we were divorcing. Children don't know us, don't want to be around us. Spouses don't know us, don't want to be around us. Yes, we want success, but we don't want that success to cannibalize on the family. Success must include the You can't say you're successful when you have money, but your family is dying. You're not successful. Don't lie. You're not successful. Success is a package. You have to be bringing your wife, your family, your money with you. Secondly, they arrive. What they predicted becomes true. Imagine the border. Abraham and Sarah arrive. They produce their passports. The man opens Sarah's passport and sees the picture. He can't believe what he sees, so he looks up. He sees this woman whose beauty he has never seen before. He takes his phone and calls his supervisor and says, Sir, you need to come to the front desk. The supervisor arrives and says, what is the problem? The man says, look. The man looks at Sarah and he cannot believe. He takes his phone. He calls he, the minister of safety and security and says, Sir, I think you need to call the king. Something is happening at the border. It needs the king. The king is told, make your way to the border. Now we've got a blue light convoy. Black sedans, eh? BMWs, Mercedes is making their way to the border. The king arrives. What is the issue? They say, your majesty, you have wives, but you have not seen this one. They show him Sarah. When he says Sarah, the king is over the moon, he immediately says, tell me now, what's your relationship? And they give the story. My sister, my brother, the king says, brilliant, no delays, organize a wedding, how much dowry do you want? Set everything in motion. We are getting married. So a wedding is organized. That evening, after the wedding, the king is sleeping when God comes. The king says to God, Anyway, I never slept with the woman. I was too tired. God says, No, 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 Abimelech. You were not tired. I took strength from you that you may not sin against me. That is my second point. If marriages and families are going to be proper, 
May God take away strength from all of us when we find ourselves naked in places God has not ordained. I place this curse on all of us. Should you be found naked where God has not ordained you to be, my brothers and sisters in this auditorium and at home, may everything go south and never to rise. May it stay down, may it go down, may it stay down until you leave that place. Take your tablet, may it go down. Take your iwi herbs, may it stay down. Go to the bathroom in the hotel, speak to it. Why are you doing this to me? Let it stay down. Because you are not where God wants you to be. But when you go home, may everything rise as high as Mount Everest. We need to be clear. The church can no longer beat about the bush where infidelity is concerned. We have pastors, infidelity. Elders, infidelity. Everywhere. Everywhere. I don't need to be a Ghanaian to know it. I come from South Africa. There is infidelity from the division to the local church. There is infidelity here from the division to the unions, to the conferences, to the local pastor and the local elders and the deacons. Infidelity is everywhere. There is infidelity from the office of the president of this country to your ministers, your governors of provinces, your constituency members of parliament. Even that whole parliament when it sits, it is bonded in infidelity. Immoral sexual things happening in parliament. In the judiciary, your ladyship, there is infidelity. Judges sleeping with each other, sleeping with the clerks, sleeping with the registrars. But we must stand and say, in the name of Jesus, let it all go down and ever to rise. <laughs> Young people, if you are not married, may it die. May it die and disappoint you. After paying for the meal, paying for the hotel, let it die in the name of Jesus. Let it die. Number three. Abraham says, I told her, listen to that phrase, I told her, this is the kindness you will show to me. Number three, learn to love each other in a manner that shows kindness. Before you speak, ask, will my words communicate kindness? Kindness is one of the most powerful yet underrated things. When you are married to a kind person, you are a li living a life of peace. Be kind. Love each other in a way that demonstrates kindness. What does that mean? It means, I, I said this earlier today to the organizing pastor of this event, uh, Pastor T.K. Mensa, I said to Pastor T.K., your wife is as foolish as mine for marrying stupid radicals like us. They took a very big leap of faith because we are very radical men. But you know what? Let me tell you. I thank God every day for my wife. 
Because I can assure you, I always tell people, you may look at me in the videos preaching and you say how I wish I was married to Pastor Mazibugo. My sister, you would have divorced me by now. <laughs> Believe me, I'm not what you think you would have divorced me. I'm not an evil man, definitely not. But what I'm saying is this, who I am, God prepared me a wife who had the strength to deal with it. Stop thinking you can love everyone. There is a manner of kindness that she can love me with. There's a manner of kindness that I can love her with. Had you been married to me, you probably would have divorced. Had I been married to you, maybe I would have committed suicide by now. So the reason why I am happily married is because we love each other in the kindness that works for us. Find the kindness that works for your marriage instead of saying, why don't you love me like? Let me teach this to all men and women. Never say to your spouse, but other men are. But other women are. You are not married to them. You are married to me. Fight me for what you need me to give to you. Not what culture says men must do. Not what society says men must do. Tell me what you want and let's work on that. Lastly, say you are my brother. Say you are my sister. Brother, sister, husband and wife. These two were gifts of God to the marriage. Let me explain. You see, to, for a marriage to be successful, you must understand this. There are seasons when you must be husband and wife. There are seasons when you must be brother and sister. There are things a, bra a husband and wife will not do for each other that a brother and sister will do. God gave a marriage the gift of two gears, like a car. We have one gear that takes us forward, called husband and wife. We have a gear that puts us on neutral, called brother and sister. How do they work? When you are a husband, your wife will upset you from time to time. But now let me tell you, when husbands are angry, do you know what happens? Their wallets are angry. When husbands are angry, their wallets are angry. Their hands are angry. He won't pay for anything. He won't do anything because he is angry. But let me teach you this. While you are angry, learn to shift to brother. In the brother gear, you fulfill your responsibilities while the husband is recovering. Are you following? So, in the brother gear, I'll give a simple example. Let's say we work. You work in the east, I work in the west. It is raining that day. It is pouring rain everywhere. And we only have one car. You see, an angry husband will wake up, take the car, drive to work. You will sort yourself out. The husband is angry. But do you know what the brother will do? The brother may still be angry. But the brother will wake up, get ready to work, put on his coat, take on his umbrella, go to catch the public transport. He may not have greeted you. He may not have kissed you. But he still demonstrated care for you. When you wake up, he is gone, but the car is here. The brother gear allows you to keep your family going while the husband is recovering. Are we together? Sister gear, you are upset with your husband. Okay, let's say you are the cooking wife, go to the kitchen. 
cook a nice meal, dish for the family, your husband eats. Yeah? You go to the bedroom, put on your leggings, put on your long pajamas, put on your gown, cover your hair, right? Now what I'm about to say, let he who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. What happened? His sister cooked for him, but his wife is offline. You get it? The wife did not dish, but the sister did. The brother and the sister here are not, not supposed to be permanent. They are temporary. They allow the family to keep going while the husband and wife are still having discussions for healing and recovery. If you don't know how to navigate these two, you will always approach everything as brother, as husband and wife, and you will crack. Why? Because you don't know how to change the temple. I close with this story. A few years ago, I was doing a week of prayer in a church. A couple asked to take me out for dinner. While we were sitting at the restaurant, this restaurant was at the harbor. There was a big ship parked there. This man says, Pastor, you see that ship there? I said, yes. He says, I am the captain of that ship. I said, really? He said, yes. I said, what do you do for a living? He says, that is a fishing ship. I go into the sea for three months. I go fishing in the deepest waters. And then, inside that ship, there are huge fridges the size of this auditorium, which keep the fish fresh. Smaller ships come. They take from the big ship and bring to the shore. Then he says, Pastor, let me tell you something about that ship. When you see it, you just see one massive piece of steel, metal. He says to me, but pastor, in between the joints, there are thick, thick rubbers in this ship. Then he teaches me. He says, you see, as we go through the sea, there are waves that are so powerful that they will pick up this ship into the air and it will come back diving into the waters. He says, do you know why, pastor, the ship doesn't break? Because though it looks like steel in your eyes, it is actually flexible because of the rubber. He says, when the waves hit, the ship bends and straightens. This allows the ship to absorb the waves. Brothers and sisters, if you are in a rigid marriage, the storms of life will break your marriage. For a marriage to survive, it must have flexibility. When storms come, brother and sister, when the storms are over, husband and wife. When the storm comes, brother and sister. When the storm ends, husband and wife. When the waters are clear, cruise as husband and wife. When the devil attacks, neutral, brother and sister. Flexible marriages will weather the storms. Rigid ones will break and sink. God bless you.